tonight on KQED Newsroom. We'll check in on the very latest in the race for the White House with Bay Area political experts and take a look at affirmative action on the ballot in California. And new analysis shows four times more women than men dropped out of the labor force in September, setting back years of progress in workplace equality. The reasons why and what can be done about it coming up. Welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. Who is Following the debacle here? of the first presidential debate between President Trump and Vice President Biden, the Commission on Debates has decided their next debate should be held virtually. Trump has said he will not participate. Biden has said he would. The president continues to project an image of strength and recovery from his COVID-19 infection. On Wednesday, he claimed that an experimental drug he had been given was, quote, a cure for the coronavirus and that he felt, quote, Perfect. We begin tonight's discussion with a focus on California's junior senator, Kamala Harris, who stepped on to the biggest debate stage of her life this week. Joining me now by Skype from Mountain View is Lan He Chen, a Hoover Institution fellow and former advisor to the presidential campaigns of Mitt Romney and Marco Rubio. And joining by Skype from Oakland is Amy Allison, the founder and president of She the People, an organization which advocates for women in politics. Thank you both so much for joining. Amy, let's start with you. You have been a supporter of Senator Harris for many years. What was the significance of seeing her on the stage? Senator Harris brought it uh, to the stage. It was the first time that uh, those of us women of color and those of, across the multiracial democratic base actually got to hear the issues. And she brought those issues of racial justice, economic justice. She mentioned Breonna Taylor. Her job one was to make sure that the coalition that needs to come to the polls in 25 days was uh, amped up and to show her chops as a former prosecutor and member of that Senate Judiciary that she can hold the Trump administration and Pence's specific role on the mishandling and failures of the response to COVID accountable. She did all of those things. I think she was stellar. And Lan He, what were your thoughts on Vice President Pence's performance? Well, I thought Vice President Pence did what he needed to do, which primarily was to uh, create that policy contrast with the Biden-Harris ticket. Look, we haven't had an opportunity, at least not in the previous debate. The policy issues didn't really come up. But you did hear Vice President Pence, for example, raising questions about how much people's taxes would increase if they uh, voted for Joe Biden. Uh, Senator Harris's past embrace of the Green New Deal and how out of step that is for many Americans, and particularly in the industrial Midwest. So I, I think Vice President Pence did what he needed to do. He presented the contrast and did it in a credible way. Amy, there's a lot of energy around ousting Donald Trump, but less enthusiasm for Joe Biden as a candidate. Do you see indications that Senator Harris is able to bring in younger voters that she's been targeting? Well, my work with She the People is organizing the most critical voters of the Democratic Party coalition. That's uh, women of color. Look, I'm a black woman. Women, uh, black women in states like Georgia, Texas, Florida, and Michigan, those are must win states. We're going to put them over the top. And there's incredible enthusiasm, particularly with Harris on the ticket. So, uh, I, I think that uh, that spans age and that spans race. Uh, so the, the short answer is there's enthusiasm to uh, uh, stop the madness that's been happening uh, in this country, st stop the bleeding, uh, stop someone who uh, embraces white su supremacy and get back right. to sense of normalcy. We're going to see historic numbers of voters okay. showing up this uh, next month. And Lon, here, the president is trailing significantly in the national polls by 10 points or more. He's also trailing in some battleground states. You've been speaking with the campaign. What are the plans to change this trend? I know he's planning on holding a rally on the White House lawn tomorrow. Well, right. I think definitely one of the issues that the campaign is dealing with is the fact the president's been off the campaign trail now. Uh, for over a week because of his COVID diagnosis, because of his time in the hospital. Uh, he hasn't been able to, to be out there. And I think those events for the campaign are clearly catalyzing events. There are opportunities for the campaign to drive narrative, for him to get earned media coverage in areas where the president needs to be successful. But I, I don't think there's any question that the president at this point, given where the public polling is, both nationally and in battleground states, needs some game changers. And it's gonna be very difficult for him to do that uh, in the context of a campaign where he cannot be out there campaigning and where the overwhelming burden of the news cycle is focused on COVID and COVID response. I think that's an issue on which 
the president and his team have been on the defensive. You know, he said that he will not participate in this virtual debate, and there's talk about pushing the debates back a little bit. It's hard for me to see the president as willing to step away from such a large platform, from tens of millions of people watching to see what he has to say. Where do you expect the debates are going to end up, Lanhe? And then, Amy, I'll come to you. The president needs these debates more than Vice President Biden does. Uh, I think based on where the polling is, based on our assessment of the race right now, it's hard to see how not having debates would benefit the president. To my point earlier about a game changer, debates can provide that opportunity. They're one of the few events where you get to see the candidates side by side in that interactive format. And to not have that, I think, is a big challenge for the president. So uh, it, it was a little puzzling that he wasn't interested in doing a debate of this kind. Perhaps he believes the in-person interaction works more to his favor. But nonetheless, in a campaign, the campaign that's down generally will want more debates and more opportunities to mm -hmm. engage. So, Amy, would it be beneficial to Joe Biden to continue debating? Or do you think it would be better for the debates to end at this point? Well, let's look at the elephant in the room. Uh, it isn't just that they're on the ropes because of COVID-19. They were responsible for the botched response there. They're, they failed and they failed. Americans are, are, are dying. Or I just had a, a good friend who lost her dad just two days ago. And I, I think it's affecting a lot of people in a way that, the, the, that, that is not being acknowledged. I mean, look, the last event that uh, Trump held uh, at the White House was a super spreader event. This is the reason that he, that so many people, his close advisors and staff, uh, that uh, top military officials are all quarantining or have positive uh, COVID uh, diagnosis. So the, the, the fact of the matter is that we can't go beyond that. I think ultimately um, we saw uh, Trump's behavior on the debate stage, he would not permit uh, a discussion about uh, points of view or policy, and this is not a regular election season, so we can't treat it that way. Whether or not he agrees to have an online um, uh, debate, a virtual uh, debate where they mm -hmm. could potentially cut his mic off and give uh, Joe Biden an opportunity to actually speak, um, it's it's almost it's almost secondary. I think that the the point right now is, and for Democrats is turning out the vote. There's enough voters right. in right. swing states, and that's gonna be the big focus uh, for the Democrats, whether or not there's a debate. Well, let's talk about what's going to bring those voters out or have them filling out their absentee ballots. Lanhe, today the president has reversed course and said that he supports a $1.8 trillion coronavirus relief package. What is with this back and forth, and how important is this as an issue on the campaign trail? Uh, as for what animates the back and forth, you know, I think part of it is that the, the president kind of goes back and forth in terms of trying to figure out whether this is something he wants or doesn't want. Uh, at the end of the day, the, it is clear that the economy is still in need of assistance, that obviously some form of recovery legislation is going to be out there. The problem is we're running out of time, Bria, before the election. You've got 20 days. We're going to have Supreme Court hearings before the Senate next week. Then the week after that's probably going to be taken up with more Supreme Court. It's hard to imagine there's much time and space to get another recovery package done, but there is clearly a need for it. I think both Republicans and Democrats can see that. The political dynamic in Washington, though, is so broken right now that the president, you know, has said he's open to it. He had said he wasn't open to it. You have similar kind of vacillation coming from Nancy Pelosi's office as mm -hmm. well. Today, Nancy Pelosi's out there talking about the 25th Amendment right. and disqualifying the president. So I think that just shows you where things are. I don't expect this to get done before the election, and I certainly don't expect relief to be coming before the election. Well, we'll certainly be keeping an eye on the SCOTUS hearings next week. Let's turn, though, to some of our state ballot measures. I want to talk about Prop 16, which is to repeal affirmative action here in California. A recent poll from the Public Policy Institute of California indicates that less than a third of likely voters support Prop 16, and some in the Chinese community have said this proposition would increase discrimination against them. Republicans are strongly against this proposition. Lanhee, can you talk us through what some of their concerns are? Well, look, uh, racial preferences have been illegal in California since 1996, since the passage of Proposition 209. It's actually been state law not to have racial preferences in effect. And during that period of time, we've actually seen increases in the percentage of black students and Hispanic students at the University of California. We've seen increases in the percentage of Asian students as well. Uh, and so the question now on the ballot is reinstating or putting in place these racial preferences, really when, when it's unclear why it is that that's necessary. And rather than trying to create a situation as the University of California 
uh, and many public institutions in, the, in, in California have had for many years this idea of a holistic approach, trying to look at a candidate to figure out whether this candidate's qualified, not just by basis of their racial background, but more broadly, all of the issues that br that, that candidate brings with them. Do we want to go from that sort of a system where we look at people comprehensively to one premised fundamentally on race? And I think that's probably why Proposition 16 is not more popular, because people don't want to return to a time when we so strictly used race to divide us uh, and look and see who would get into colleges or be hired. And Amy, I know you are chomping at the bit to get in on this question. I I'm curious about why you think it hasn't resonated with voters despite the outpouring of support for racial justice that we saw throughout this summer and into the fall on our streets as people protested. Well, look, the majority of uh, people in California are demanding racial justice. It's there's a tremendous support uh, for uh, leveling the playing field when it comes to race, for admissions and for opportunities for businesses, small businesses to contract with public entities. Uh, and I reject wholeheartedly that the idea that there's not a lot of support for Prop 16. I think what the challenge has been is awareness. I mean, we have in the state of California as well as as well as nationally. Um, a focus on people's health, a focus on the fact that a third of Californians can't pay rent, uh, that there's, 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 no, there's not a lot of relief coming from anywhere. I mean, I think those are all a lot of the issues uh, that make it difficult for people to focus on what's happening statewide. But when we have found that when people understand that Prop 16 um, undoes a great wrong, that you know, it, it puts California in with most of the states. Most states allow the consideration of race and the history of racism as part of their uh, uh, assessment. And that um, I'm joining groups like Chinese Affirmative Action and the ACLU, and in fact, Senator Kamala Harris supports this. I mean, we're talking about uh, something that would bring back a level of balance and offer Asian Americans, Latinas, and uh, yeah. uh, black people uh, opportunities that haven't been available um, since uh, since those rules were changed uh, uh, more than a decade ago. Amy, let's turn to voter turnout. Are the Democrats focusing more on turning out likely Democratic voters or on getting the independents to come over and join them? No, this isn't a persuasion game at all. We have the number of voters we need record turnout. Look, we're facing uh, both a pandemic where people have to have a vote safely. We have national messaging coming from the White House and other places that is, tries to um, you know, minimize confidence and vote by mail. And we have a situation where um, women of color in particular, who have typically been ignored by both parties, actually are the margin of victory in some of the key swing states. So it's all about turnout for the next 25 days. Lanhi, where do Republicans need to focus in terms of turnout? Well, the president has focused on turning out his base. That's not going to be enough. Uh, the base of support for the president is strong. It's vocal. But the, but the numbers are not sufficient to get him across the finish line in places like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Florida, Arizona, states he's going to need to win to win the presidency. So not only is it about turning out the president's base, but figuring out how to get swing voters, undecided voters to come with the president, uh, notwithstanding some of the, the dialogue that we've heard from the president directly. I think it's got to focus on what his next four years are going to look like and the policy vision versus the personality, because I think that is going to make it a little bit more challenging for him to get the support he needs. All right. Well, we'll be watching. Lan He Chen with the Hoover Institution, Amy Allison with She the People. Thank you. Visit kqed.org slash voter guide for a comprehensive look at all the state and local ballot measures, including summaries and arguments for and against them. Some analysts have suggested that the economic slowdown related to the pandemic should be dubbed a she-session rather than a recession due to the disproportionate impact on working women. The latest jobs numbers continue to showcase the struggle. Of the approximately 1.1 million people over age 20 who left the workplace between August and September, approximately 865,000 were women while 216,000 were men, according to analysis by the National Women's Law Center. The economic impact of the pandemic has been particularly acute for women of color. According to the California Budget and Policy Center, more than 20 percent of black and Latinx women lost their jobs this spring compared to 10 percent of white women.
Joining me now by Skype from Sacramento is Kristen Schumacher, a senior policy analyst at the California Budget and Policy Center. And joining by Skype from Fayetteville, Arkansas, is Hema Zamora Rodriguez, a professor of economics at the University of Arkansas. Ladies, thank you both so much for joining me. And I appreciate that you are here doing this discussion, despite the fact that you are also working mothers like me, and you also have young children. Hema, let's start with you. How is this virus impacted your ability to work and impacted your time at home with the kids? It's been really hard. Yeah, I'm fortunate because I'm a professor and I, I have a flexible job and I can work from home and my husband too. So we are doing what we can to take turns and be able to work uh, while uh, providing support for the schooling for the kids. But um, it has meant that we work all the time. There is no break. Kristen, do you have a similar experience? Absolutely. Our child care provider closed temporarily in March, right when the pandemic hit. And we lost care for our four-year-old. And we also have a seven-year-old who in instantly started engaging in distance learning. And so we, my husband and I were fortunate also to be able to work from home, but it meant that we didn't have any any outside caregiving help and we had to balance work and caregiving and distance learning for our kids and it was incredibly challenging and we ended up working in the wee hours of the morning and late into the night just to try to get everything in and it was very difficult. And it continues to be and and yet you know I think in many ways we consider ourselves lucky because we still have our jobs. There are many many thousands of women who do not and I'd like Kristen for you to dive into that particular issue first. Can you talk about which sectors of work are being most impacted by the virus and the correlation between those sectors and women's employment? Absolutely. So job losses in California have really been concentrated in low paying industries such as the hospitality and leisure industry. And that includes jobs at restaurants, at, at hotels, or at entertainment venues, just as an example. And this means that these workers were probably already receiving low wages and low pay, and that makes them less likely to be able to afford an economic setback, like losing their jobs or having the hours cut dramatically. And these job losses have hit women hard, particularly women of color here in California. And Hema, you've also just mentioned another piece that is a big part of the problem, that's child care. You've been studying this issue through some work you've been doing at the University of Southern California. Can you tell us how COVID is impacting working mothers? Yes, so we have been studying that. And what we see is that with the school closures and the increased need for child care at home, what we see is that women are doing much more of the work than men. When we data from back in April, May, we see that one out of three working women declared to be the only person in the household providing a child care as compared with one out of 10 men. And in recent data that we are just collecting some preliminary results uh, so that the situation now has not improved. If anything, is is even a little bit worse now. And Emma, what are your concerns about this, about women making this hard financial decision that they may not be able to work because they need to be home taking care of kids or seniors in their family? Yes, so my concern is that in our work, we see that these uh, child care arrangements have consequences for uh, um, women in the labor force in terms of working hours. For instance, we see that more women than men are having to reduce their working hours or they are leaving the labor force, like you say, all together to combine these uh, increased child care needs to be able to do it. Kristen, you've been tracking women's well-being in California since 2016, and this week you just put out your updated Women's Well-Being Index. Can you give us a snapshot of how women are doing economically in the state of California and perhaps some variance by region? Sure. So our California Women's Well-Being Index shows that women living in counties in the San Joaquin Valley, the northern Sacramento Valley, the North Coast, and parts of the Inland Empire are faring worse compared to women in other regions of the state. For example, in many counties in the San Joaquin Valley, more than one in five women were living in poverty. And I think just for a little bit of context study, living in poverty means that a single mom with two kids is trying to make ends meet on less than $20,000 a year. And I think many of us can agree that that's untenable, especially in a high cost state like California.
And Hamma, we've been talking about women as sort of a broad group, but when you look at the national numbers, you certainly see a disproportionate impact on Latinas. Can you tell us about why this is and what those numbers look like? Yes, so for Latinas as well as for African American uh, women, they have been impacted uh, the hardest in terms of employment loss, probably because they work more in the service sector that has been more affected by this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And also, what we see in recent data is that, interestingly, also uh, Latino uh, families and African Americans are having their kids uh, to be, they are having their, to have their kids in online schooling or hybrid. So they, they also have increased childcare needs. So I, I wonder if this also makes it harder for them to recover because they have the kids at home. And Kristen, are we seeing a similar trend in the state of California in terms of how Latinx and uh, black women are facing more unemployment than white women? Absolutely. The California Women's Well-Being Index shows that even prior to the pandemic, a much larger share of Black, Latinx, and Native American women were more likely to be unemployed and to live in poverty. And this just means that many women, particularly women of color, were already struggling to make ends meet, and many likely, as a result of this health and economic crisis, are facing a financial cliff. Mm. Kristen, I'd like to turn to how women compare to men economically in the state. What do your numbers show you? So when we're looking at women, just aggregated by race and ethnicity, compared to white men here in California, the highest earning demographic group, we know that Latinx women earn only 42 cents as compared to white man's dollar. Mm -hmm. And that means because of that wage gap that they have fewer resources for their household to pay the bills, to pay for childcare, housing and food, for example. And we know that if a woman loses her job, she immediately becomes more economically unstable. She's not able to save as much for retirement. Her family becomes poorer and she becomes more dependent on her partner. Hema, could you talk us through these long-term implications of women losing their job through this pandemic? Yes, so women losing their jobs as well as women reducing, having to reduce their working hours will have important implications, I think, in the long term. Um, we know that when women leave the labor force, it's very hard for them to come back. Uh, reducing working hours will have implications for future promotions. And all these, uh, these crises have the capacity to put us, to represent a big step back in terms of gender equality. These issues are not new, Hema. What do you see as the most important way to support women in the workplace? My hope is by bringing these issues we uh, outside, we mentalize everybody in the workplace that th this is a crisis that we are all living and we need more support. So unfortunately, not everybody has the flexibility in their jobs to work from home. And I think we need, I hope that uh, um, employers can be more understanding and supportive and take this into account uh, um, that this is an exceptional situation that we are living. And Kristen, when I say it's not new, obviously the issue of women dealing with child care, dealing with senior care, and dealing with home care, as well as their work in the workplace, that struggle is not new, but the amount to which it has financially impacted women and taken away some of the gains over recent years that we've made in terms of equality in the workplace, that is certainly new and exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, so I would like to ask you as well, systemically, what can change, what needs to change in order to promote women to a place of equality in the workplace in California? So we need two things here in the nation as a whole and specifically in California. We need to make sure that families have access to childcare, safe and affordable childcare so that their kids have a healthy place to thrive and learn and grow while they're at at work. This is critically important. We know child care providers have been hit hard by this pandemic and many have closed their doors. And if families don't have a place for their children to learn and grow, it's going to stymie our economic recovery and we're going to be unable to show real economic growth without an adequate child care infrastructure to support our economy. And the second thing I would add is that we need comprehensive paid family leave in the United States. We're one of only a few countries in the world that does not have a national paid family leave program. And there's 
no reason in a rich country like the United States that workers should have to make a choice between paying their bills or caring for their family. Hannah, there's been some back and forth in the White House this week about whether or not new stimulus talks would resume. It looks like potentially they are back on. If there is a new stimulus that's passed, what is the most important thing that you think women need in order to regain some of this economic strength that they had? Honestly, I think that the big limitation for women right now is the fact that schools are, were not able to fully open for in-person education across the country. So I think um, the best that could happen is uh, more support uh, for the schools to have the means to safely open for kids to attend uh, five days in person. And Kristen, anything you'll be looking for in terms of a new potential economic stimulus package that would give relief to women? Absolutely. You know, I'm thinking the most right now about women and workers who have lost their jobs and how they're really struggling to pay the bills and um, put food on the table. And so I'm looking for federal policymakers to reinstate the 600 per week additional unemployment benefits that ended in July. And in a high cost state like California, it's critically important that unemployed workers don't lose their homes, especially in the midst of a pandemic. And I also would hope that federal policymakers would boost food assistance. We know that here in California, more than one in five households, Black and Latinx households with kids, don't have enough food for their families. And a boost of food assistance will help families feed their children and make it through this economic downturn. All right. Kristen Schumacher with the California Budget and Policy Center. Hema Zamora Rodriguez with the University of Arkansas. Thank you both for your time and insight. Thank you. You can visit calbudgetcenter.org to explore an interactive tool that reveals differences in women's economic well-being across the state. And you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org slash kqednewsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. You can reach me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Priya D. Clemens. Before we go, we want to bring you a moment of something beautiful in our shared world. This week, our videographer Jim took a drive to the Marin Headlands and captured some of the sights and sounds of the coast and the Pacific Ocean. From all of us here at KQED Newsroom, thanks for joining us. Good night.